Okay, today we're talking about the rate of reaction. Rate, oops, rate represents how fast a reaction will go. So rate of reactions. Now how fast a reaction goes has nothing to do with delta H. Rate of reaction is about the speed of which speed of, let's say, products being produced. Or speed at which the reactants disappear. Products, products, not products being produced. Yeah. Okay, so speed at which the products are being produced. Now, as we learned yesterday, delta H is how many kilojoules per mole of a substance is being released or absorbed. That does not change. Kilojoules per mole is determined about thermodynamics between what? It's based upon the stability of the reactants versus the stability of the products. In this little curve that I drew here, what would be the delta H, positive or negative? Positive or negative, the delta H, the difference where I start and I finish. Positive. What's the size of it? Well, it depends upon how high this is and how high this is, and then I subtract. That value is fixed. How fast a reaction goes has nothing to do with the difference of the potential energy of the reactants and products. So get that out of your head. So how fast a reaction goes depends on a few factors, some of which I'm sure you know. But before I can get started with the factors, there are two requirements in order for a reaction to, go, to occur. The first one, in order for a reaction to occur. Now, in order for a reaction to occur, we have a fancy name for it. We call it effective collision. So in order for two things to come together and make an effective collision, they need two things. And we talked about this. The first one, they need high enough kinetic energy. Molecule A and molecule B. When they come in contact, they must collide in order for reaction to go. But what do they have on the outside of them? Electrons. So when they come together, they're going to repel. They have to have en enough kinetic energy to overcome the what? Repulsion forces of the electrons. So we say, number one, they have to have high enough kinetic energy. Now, we learned that this kinetic energy that they have to have represents the what? represents the what in my potential energy curve? What is it? The energy needed to start the reaction. What do we call that? Activation. So you have to have enough kinetic energy so that the two what? The two molecules can come together and collide. Now, I'm looking for something that I used to have. Got one. Okay, good. Now, so in order to have effective collision, these two atoms who have their electrons on the outside have to have enough kinetic energy to overcome the repulsive forces. If they don't, the reaction doesn't start, and we don't have enough activation energy. So they're just two independent particles. Now, the second, and this is really true for bigger atoms, but the second is they have to have proper orientation. Okay, that one is not so clear to people. The second is proper orientation. Proper orientation, or the correct orientation. Now, what does that mean? Well, in big molecules, okay, and we can draw these big proteins that have these crazy shapes, okay, they may be one area where the bond can occur. And if you've got another, let's say, big protein, they may only have another area. So these two places might be the only places where the bond can occur. We'll talk more about this in AP. So what has to happen is that these things have to collide only in this area. So these guys might have enough kinetic energy to overcome the repulsive forces, but if they don't collide in the right spot, the reaction probably doesn't occur especially with big molecules. When it's individual atoms, it's not going to matter. But when it's compounds or big molecules and organic reactions, 
they have to have proper orientation. So you have two atoms. If they have enough kinetic energy to overcome the repulsive forces, okay, and if they collide with the right spot, orientation, what do you have? You've got a bond, a reaction. Two individual atoms, right? They come together, and they're what? They stick together. All right? Now, that's important. Now, what I want you to visualize through all the rest of my demonstrations, there are some factors here that affect this. I want you to visualize my family. Okay? I have a big family. Okay? And they tend to be um, some big people. And when we have, um, let's say, reunions or any kind of weddings in the family, um, we're probably the worst dancers of all time. Okay? They dance to their own music. Music's playing and you're saying, wait a minute, no one's dancing to that. That's kind of weird. In any case, um, so they're like random molecules on a dance floor. Now, let's pretend a collision occurs effectively when an elbow of one of my relatives hits an elbow of another. What are the chances of an elbow-to-elbow -elbow collision on a dance floor? Now, the elbow-to-elbow -elbow is proper orientation. What, is the, what are the chances of, of an elbow-to-elbow -elbow collision? Very, not very good when it comes to 50 people on a dance floor. But... If I increase the number of collisions, won't I, by statistics, increase the number of collisions that will occur between an elbow and elbow? So all I have to do to increase a reaction rate is increase the frequency of collisions, and then, by chance, we'll have more effective collisions. Does that make sense? All I have to do. So what factors will increase the rate or frequency of my collisions? Well, first one. When a fast song hits the dance floor of my family, we all come running. The, the worst thing about my family is they think they can dance. But in any case, big people swinging. I've had people lose, have uh, lost a tooth a couple of years back. It's, it's crazy. You have to go prepared. <laughs> okay. Now, the point I want to make here is the first factor that affects um, how fast the reaction goes that will increase the number of collisions that will, by statistics, increase the number of effective collisions is temperature. You know this. Okay, first factor is temperature. What does temperature do? Temperature does what to a rate of reaction? Well, let's think about this. Here's a nice little demonstration. Take these off for a second. And let's put those down. Okay. Now, temperature, and I'm going to put this on the big screen, I think. Or I'm not going to, I guess I can't because I'm kind of videotaping. Um, what I have here is some very cold water. And what I have here is some very hot water. Was boiling before. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Now, what I have is some light sticks. Okay, so what I'm going to do, activate the light stick, activate this light stick, activate this light stick. Okay, this one's at room temperature. I'm going to put this in cold water. I'm going to put this in hot water. Okay, so you know that this is the cold water, this is the hot water, this is the room temperature water. Okay, what's going to happen? As temperature, the warm water, cold water, the warm water is here, cold water is here. So C to W, alphabetical. What's happening? Okay, let's turn the lights off for a second. The warm water light stick is going to do what? Should it get brighter or dimmer? Right, it should get brighter. And the cold one, which probably needs some ice cubes. Okay, and it works better with liquid nitrogen, but I don't have any. Okay, you probably can see already that the one in the cold water compared to the other two is what? Getting what? Yeah, can you see that or no? Yeah, in fact, if I had liquid nitrogen, which I don't right now, I can definitely make it turn off. Okay, so this ice cold water, okay, is making this go dim. Definitely dimmer. Here's the warm one. So what's happening? The reaction, 
okay? The warm one to the right is brighter. Why? Why did warm water create more brightness? These are exo or endothermic reactions. Is energy being given off? Yes, light's given off, exothermic. Who is more exothermic? The warm or the cold? The warm or the cold? Warm, why? Radio reactions faster because increasing the temperature does what? Makes my family move what? Faster. And if I move my family faster on the dance floor, there's going to be more collisions. If there's more collisions, there's just by statistics more effective collisions. Clearly, you can see that there's a difference between the two. Okay? And again, it took a little while because my temperatures aren't that great. Okay? But you can clearly see the one to the left, okay, is clearly going to have um, lower brightness or luminous, less luminous because it's reacting less. You guys know this, right? You want to keep light sticks forever? What do you do with them? Put in the freezer. You stop the reaction. If you've got batteries, what do you do with them? You put them in the refrigerator or the freezer. They're chemical reactions. You prevent the reaction from going. You slow them down. Make my family dance on a slow jam, although it's still dangerous. There's less collisions. There's still some because no one can dance. But there's less collisions. Clearly, you can see the difference now. Okay? Room temperature. Okay? Warmer conditions, more collisions. Is the delta H greater on the one to the right? No. It's just the rate of reaction is. Okay, so put those away. Let's continue. So clearly as temperature goes up, the rate of reaction goes up. Why? Because you made them go faster. By making them go faster, there's more collisions. Okay, what's another factor that affects? Okay, another factor that affects is, how about we pick how much dancers are on the dance floor, right? A a, a, my, back to my family reunion, okay? Again, think of it this way. It's intuitive, but you have to use the right. Here's my dance floor, okay? And here are my dancers. And they move randomly because they can't dance. There's no in sync motion going on. Even if in sync performed, it'd still be nothing in sync, okay? Now, they're going randomly. Okay, banging across, hey, someone's dancing in double time, okay, they're just moving randomly, okay, and they're hitting each other. If I increase the temperature, they go faster, they collide more often, we know that, we saw an example of a demonstration. Now, the second factor is concentration, number two. What if I increase the concentration, increase the molarity, it was a two molar solution, and now it's a four molar solution. If I add more dancers to the dance floor, what's gonna happen to the number of collisions? It's going to increase. Okay, so I've got this demonstration here. Okay, and let me try to show you, if I can. Let me get a little lower here. I got a demonstration here, really cool. it's called a clock iodine reaction, okay? And what it is, is um, it's starch with iodine and some other chemicals. And when the iodine is available after some amount of time, okay, it will go all uh, to a dark blue-black complex. You guys did this in biology to test for starches. So here's what I'm going to do here. Okay, I'm going to add some starch. It's a New England demonstration all of a sudden. There's a big hair here, that's kind of nice. Okay, all right, I wish. That was my last big one! All right, darn it! All right, now, I'm gonna add some potassium iodate. It's a complex reaction, but you know when the reaction's done when you see it go all black, or at least all dark blue. Okay, it's gonna take about 30 seconds or so. Okay, but we're watching it, watching it carefully. I should have put some time on there. We could do it one more time, I'll put a time up. All right. Now it's gonna flash, if you blink you'll miss it. I 
Maybe we missed it. Oh! What happened? Okay, now it's a clock reaction, so it keeps going, but after a certain time. Anyone clock it for me? We'll do it one more time. Of course, I don't have a beaker. Put, put a clock out. In fact, I can do that. Give me a timer up here. Give me a timer. Let's go uh, timer. All right, hold on. Let's go online timer. Online timer. Stopwatch might work better, but hey. Countdown timer. Here we go. OK. So I'm going to give this a someone to touch. OK, you're my man all the time. OK, now we'll do this one more time. OK, and we're, this is important because maybe we'll heat it, maybe go faster, see if the temperature affects this as well. So let's do one more time. OK, here we go. Oh, it's upside down? OK, so let's go with our two chemicals, potassium iodide and starch. That's not. Where's the other one? Here we go. Start with the starch. Here we go. Okay. And here comes, as soon as I pour, you start. You ready? You might have to tap on it. Ready? Go. It's going. It's going. No, it's not. Oh, you got it on? Okay, we got it on someone's phone. Okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> technical difficulties, but we have it going. I guess it wasn't as clear as it was. Get that thing out of there. <laughs> I'll take this back. <laughs> Who knows? All right, how much was it? 30 seconds. About 30 seconds, okay. All right, let's go find another timer now. That was a one-to-one. -one. Now, if I was to heat this, what do you think? The time would be if I was to heat this. Would it be it'd be quicker? So let's heat some to do this. Online stopwatch. You ready? Uh, I don't know. Let's go on stopwatch. I'm gonna count up. Okay, this might be easier. <laughs> There's a start button. Okay, now here's what I'm gonna do. Pay attention. I'm going to change. We're going to take some of this and heat this. But we're going to change the concentrations. What I have here is, or had, oh, no, we're over here. I have a one molar solution. I have a 0.5 molar solution. I have a 0.25 molar solution. And I have a 0.125. So there it is right there. Okay, in fact, I'll move this over so we can see it as a class two. Okay. Okay, so we're good, I think. Now, do we have a timer? I can't keep track of everything. Okay, now, watch what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna pour. Okay, now here's what I'm gonna do, guys. I have more concentrated to least concentrated. So, by having less dancers on the dance floor, what do you think is going to happen to the rate of reaction? Is it going to go faster or slower? Slower. Now, i got to pour these at the same time, which is issues. So, I'm probably going to need a little bit of help. Okay? Thank you. That was an awkward pause. Okay, I, if you just do one, Jackie, that'd be great. So we're gonna do one, two, three, four, and you go in this one. Just don't step on something. Too late. Okay. You, this on this. Yeah, you, you take these two. You have two hands, right? Yeah, I do. So yeah, so ready? Ready? Hold on. It's gonna go. We're practicing. One, two, three, four. Good job. I'll take this away. Okay. Now. Ready? You got these two, yes. I got these. This is more concentrated than this. So let's see if I can get a cascading effect. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three, pour. Step aside, Jackie. Oh. 
Oh, it's awkward pause. I'm going to go that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now we expect what? Hopefully this one goes first. Now it'll probably take 30 seconds. But the one that is more concentrated has more dances on the dance floor, more collisions, therefore more effective collisions. Now we, our baseline was what? 30 seconds. So this one will be 30 seconds. Have we got the 30 seconds yet? 34. Hopefully I mixed them correctly. Well, there's one. Okay, I went a little too slow. 36. 36. Well, depends on how I, I measured them. Okay, so that one first. Second. Okay. It should be an exponential change. So the third one should go next. And it's taking longer because there's what? It's taking longer because there's less what? Dancers on the dance floor. Okay, this one's going to take the longest, obviously. But you can see how this works. The reaction that is the slowest is the one that is the least concentrated. Okay? At some point. Today, maybe. Maybe. Okay. I'll start with the next demonstration while that <laughs> continues. Okay? All right. Now, the third factor is surface area. Hey, okay. It finally went. Barely went, though, didn't it? Okay, barely went. Okay, so the third factor is surface area. Now, how does surface area affect reaction rate? Well, surface area, uh, let's see if I have what I'm looking for. Surface area exposes more atoms to the collisions. Okay? Um, all right. Uh, now, I'm looking for some sawdust that came from my family. Uh, I had it back here. Okay, hold on. So now I'm going to take some sawdust and I'm going to light it. Okay? Here we go. I got some sawdust. Now the reason why I got some sawdust is because I have a uh, family member who works, used to be a builder, and now works, um, he works making of all things toilet seat covers, wooden toilet seat covers. Not sure why that's cool, but he does that. Now I'm going to take some, I, I had to have some sawdust from toilet seat covers. I had to. I just wanted to, I mean, I, I don't know how they test them, but in any case. Now, I have a pile of sawdust here. Now, sawdust is grinded up carbon. Now, I'm going to light it. It's going to light. Why wouldn't it? But how is it reacting? How is it reacting? From the outside in, correct? This isn't a great demonstration, but it's not working so well because it's burning from the what? Outside. Outside. If you've got a dance party, right? And you're in the circle of the dance party, you're not exposed to the other collisions. If you open yourself up, you're going to have a great reaction. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take some of this toilet seat cover sawdust, and I'm going to put it in this funnel, okay? And I'm going to blow it as a dust. By blowing as a dust, I should create a rate of reaction that's much, much higher, okay? I need a burner. Okay, a little burner here. Okay, ready? Oh, oh my God! Oh. <laughs> now, where was there a faster rate of reaction? Burning it from the outside or burning it and blowing it as a dust? Ready? Blowing it at the dust. They call these grain elevator explosions. Why? By exposing more atoms. By exposing more atoms. Okay? Have a great day. Look for the homework and a form.